Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, June 13th, 2022. And on this episode, I'm talking about one of the most important and influential documents on liberty from the period of the American Revolution, that is, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. It actually influenced the text of the Declaration of Independence, which was passed shortly after that, plus uh, some foundational structures of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and a lot more beyond that. It's also one that, if you're like me, we're really just not taught about this much if at all, in the government-run schools, and probably for good reason. It's part of our forgotten, or we can say our ignored foundation. And I'm going to cover that on this episode. But before getting to that, a quick hello and a big thank you for spending some of your time with me today. I hope you had a great weekend. I really appreciate you kicking off your week with an episode of Path to Liberty, whether you're watching live or in the archive first time, or you've been here for every episode since day one. Thank you so much for being here. I should mention that if you want to follow along with the stuff that I'm going to mention in this episode, I've got a great article by Kevin Gutzman, another one by Mike Meharry, plus original source documents. We're talking George Mason, James Madison, so many others. So if you want to follow along with that, I publish a blog post for each episode about one to two hours after the live stream is done. And you can find all of those, all the archives, all the platforms, all the stuff that we do uh, for this show for all time, four years or so of episodes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to to Liberty. And I do want to say hello, give uh, people another moment or so to join us, get notifications and join us on the live stream. So hello to everyone out in the live chat. There's Tim Martin and Liberty Revolutionary, Dixie Strong, Poet Fisherman, Patricia Dance, good to see you, Cole Cochran, Clay Kent, Jennifer Coop, Senator DT, Chris Schulte, uh, Cole again, oh, Cole, hello twice in Jackson, Mississippi, Hunters over on Twitch. I always love it when people join us on Twitch. Thank you. Cheriton Farmer, Jay Armstrong, Gary Townsend, Joe Doe, Gunnay in Missouri, and everyone else. I apologize for missing anybody. I'll try to look over uh, the comments either later in the episode and see if I can reply to anything or get ideas for future episodes, or I read them over the next day or so. And leaving comments actually tells those algorithms, you're really interested in this stuff. So even if you are just mostly listening along, leaving a comment every now and then does help us spread the word. Anyways, let's get right to this, and I want to start out with an article that we published Yesterday by Mike Meharry, an overview of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. The title is Setting a Foundation. The Virginia Declaration of Rights on June 12th, 1776, that was yesterday in history, the 5th Virginia Convention passed the Virginia Declaration of Rights. It is arguably the most important founding document that most people have never heard of. I like how he put that. This is kind of a, now it's starting to be kind of an old article published back in 2013, but the principles are very solid by Kevin Gutzman over at uh, Constituting America. Kevin has been a great friend to the TAC for many, many years, advised us on, on how to approach a lot of things in history for a long time. Appreciate him and his work. And so it's nice to be able to cite his uh, writing from time to time. And here's how Kevin put it in that article. Again, these will be linked to in the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Kevin writes, the Virginia Declaration of Rights is one of the key source documents of the U.S. Constitution. You think about how the Constitution is structured. To understand what it means, you have to understand the foundation that it was built upon. It's not, I know a lot of people want to just be textualists, just read the words and then grab a dictionary, but sometimes definitions change over time. And if you don't have context, you can't understand what they were trying to do. So you have to understand what they built this upon. Virginia Declaration of Rights is a foundational source document for the Constitution and many others. The f this first American Declaration of Rights includes multiple provisions later echoed and even copied by the authors of the U.S. Constitution. Kevin goes on. He says the Declaration's chief author, George Mason, and one of the two other main contributors, James Madison. Now, I, there really were only three people really working on this in the committee. It was almost entirely Mason writing the first draft. Madison added some, and another guy, uh, Nicholas, uh, did some work on it as well. But it was primarily Mason. They played extremely prominent roles in both the writing and ratification of the Constitution and the movement culminating in the Bill of Rights. So the resemblance is no surprise. 
We know that the declaration here from Wikipedia, they actually have a pretty decent overview. A lot of times they, this is garbage over there, but this one's actually pretty well done. The declaration was adopted unanimously by the Fifth Virginia Convention. This is, uh, you know, after the governor steps down or he well, basically runs away, we can say. And uh, the House of Burgesses decided to actually devolve into a people's convention so they could write this because they wanted to act on behalf of the people. They weren't acting as agents of the crown anymore. They were adopted by unanimously by the Fifth Virginia Convention at Williamsburg, Virginia, on June 12, 1776, as a separate document from the Constitution of Virginia, which was later adopted on June 29th. Ten articles were initially drafted by George Mason between May 20th to 26th. Three other articles were added in committee, seen in the original draft in the handwriting of Thomas Ludwell Lee, but the author is not known. Patrick Henry actually persuaded the convention to delete a section that would have prohibited bills of attainder, arguing that ordinary laws could be ineffective against some terrifying offenders. Anyway, some interesting history there. I just wanted to give you some of that kind of uh, generic dates and times and names history. But let's get into some of the more foundational parts of it. And Mike writes in his article, this is Mike Meharry's article again. It will be linked to in the show notes, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty here. Kirk Morrison says, I grew up learning the Virginia Declaration of Rights. I am jealous. I grew up learning Marx and other garbage. Virginia, Virginia says, uh, uh, I live near George Mason's Gunston Hall and I follow uh, their website, the Gunston Hall website and uh, blog and things like that. It has some interesting stuff from time to time as well. So that's pretty cool. Some people actually do learn real history. Very few of us actually do. Mike writes that most significantly, the first three sections establish the philosophical framework that supports the entire U.S. system of government from the Declaration through the Articles of Confederation, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the whole thing. You can see these foundational principles. It declares, quote, that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights. It's a natural rights foundation. And if you're going to structure a government, the idea is to to uh, limit the government in such a way that it's very difficult for it to be able to violate those natural rights when the people actually learn how to exercise those rights, whether government wants to or not. That's a side note. So people have certain inherent rights. Hmm, sounds familiar to the Declaration of Independence, right? That all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people. This is an affirmation of a huge sea change in political thought that goes all the way back to 1761. James Otis Jr., his argument against the writs of assistance, where John Adams says was the beginning of the American Revolution, a revolution in thought. It was a change in the view of sovereignty. Sovereignty meaning final authority. The founding generation, the old revolutionaries, they toiled under a system where a single person or just a, uh, the king in parliament held sovereignty and final authority. So if there was an unwritten constitution that said, well, you can only do these things or was understood that they were only going to be able to do these things, if they're sovereign, they have the final say over what they can do. And so when James Otis Jr. said an act against the Constitution is void, he was noting that the Constitution was the supreme law. And this means that the authority for that has to come from somewhere. And George Mason reaffirmed that view, writing for the Virginia Declaration of Rights that power comes from the people. It is the government is a tool of the people. Now, today, it's not a really great tool. It's more like a bludgeoning instrument, but that's a different story. Uh, Thomas Paine once wrote that an, a constitution is not an act of government, but an act of the people constituting a government. And that's how we're supposed to look at things. All power is vested in and consequently derived from the people. And finally, that the community has an indubitable, I love that line, that word, inalienable and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish government in such manner as shall be judged most conducive to the public wheel. You can see how Jefferson and the Committee of Five kind of drew upon this. Jefferson certainly wanted to be, uh, you know, holding the line for his Virginians, of course, here. Now, a little history behind this. This is uh, what I was mentioning a little bit earlier here. Back to Mike Meharry's article. He said, months before the 13 colonies approved the Declaration of Independence, Virginia was already operating as a free and independent state. They had already declared their own independence in Virginia. The colonial governor fled in January 76 after the burning of Norfolk. I know I don't pronounce that properly. My apologies. In his absence, the governor's council, which is the upper house, 
and the House of Burgesses dissolved themselves into a convention under the authority of the people. This was the Fifth Virginia Convention and assumed control over colonial affairs. So in May, they decided to declare themselves a free and independent state. They absolved themselves from all allegiance to or dependence upon the crown or parliament of Great Britain. That was May 15th, 1776. Significantly, that's a pretty decent amount of time before the Declaration of Independence was uh, drafted, the Lee Resolution on July 2nd and then uh, July 4th. The resolution also included three action steps when they passed that on May 15th. So this is what they did uh, in in uh, the the Continental Congress as well. They said, hey, here's, a res- here's what we're going to do. We've got this Lee Resolution. We're going to declare independence. We need to come up with a form of government. We have to do some treating with other countries. That's how they talked about it back then and, and basically established foreign relations. And this is what they said here in Virginia as well. They wanted to draft a Declaration of Rights. They were going to uh, draft a constitution, a new constitution for Virginia, and then establish treaties and then relationships, treaties with other countries and relationships with the other colonies. I covered this in some detail uh, in an episode that I did last May, May 7th, 2021, talking about dozens of declarations of independence that actually happened on the road to independence, the national, I guess we could call it, the declaration, the 13 free and sovereign and independent states coming together. Uh, people think of it wrong, national. I shouldn't even say that and give anyone any hints of going the wrong direction. But anyways, these other declarations of independence I covered in an episode highlighting not just Virginia, but a number of other ones on the road to those 13 free and independent states, July 4th and then in August as well. So back to Kevin Gutsman, he says, self-consciously following the example of Britain's glorious revolution. So there's great history behind the Virginia Declaration of Rights as well. We want to look back to what they built on for this. I'm not getting into that here, but just pointing out that the Declaration of Right, Kevin writes, had been the condition of William and Mary's joint assumption of the English monarchy. So there was a tradition of a declaration or a bill of rights. We know, I think it was 1689. Virginians put their fundamental statement of political principles first and then adopted the Constitution to implement it. So they have base principles to start it out. These are what we want to to follow, and then the Constitution is the structure that will help achieve these goals. Virginians thought of their colony as independent from that point. And again, George Mason drew very heavily from that uh, English Bill of Rights. It was 1689 that I see here in Mike Meharry's article, and then also the writings of John Locke. He begins by establishing the philosophical foundations of government, just like what Kevin was talking about. They start with these foundational principles about what the government is there for, kind of like the Declaration of Independence, I guess, including separation of powers, which was so essential. We don't think about that nearly as much. We see things that happen today, like, oh, Congress no longer declares war because, well, the executive can make the determination of whether or not the country will go to war, rather than recognizing that these were separated intentionally, whether it was 60 days or one day or one minute, the executive would never have any opportunity in any case, according to James Madison, to decide whether or not the country was going to go to war. So they had some philosophical foundations at the beginning. Separation of powers was so essential. I'll get to that again in just a moment. And then he outlined several specific individual rights, including many that were reflected in the Constitution's Bill of Rights. The document affirms the right to a jury trial, protection from excessive fines and bail, a ban on general warrants that authorize searches without facts, freedom of the press, and the subordination of the militia to the civil authority. Basically, all of the people, according to George Mason, all able-bodied. And again, separation of powers was so important. And James Madison was there. He was the youngest member of that Virginia, Fifth Virginia Convention. I think he was just 25 years old at the time, maybe 24, 26, somewhere around that. But he's heavily influenced by this as well. And he saw from the great Montesquieu uh, back in 1748 how important, important that separation of powers was. And he included separation of powers just like they did in the Virginia Bill of Rights as his original 16th Amendment in his proposal for the Bill of Rights. I covered that in an episode uh, just a couple of months ago, the other 16th Amendment, Separation of Powers. I thought I would mention that one as well since we're talking about that in uh, Virginia. And I will link to that in the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. So let's go through some highlights from the Declaration of Rights. Section one, the first thing, 
Check this out. This is very similar Declaration of Independence, that all men are by nature, by nature, equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing, pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. This is very similar, again, if we're talking about the beginning of the American Revolution, early 1760s. This is very similar to what James Otis had to say in the rights of the British colonists asserted and proved 1764. Here's how he asserted the rights of the people of British America, at least at that time. The colonists are by law of nature freeborn, as indeed all men are, white or black. Now, if we go back to that section one, and this is just an interesting piece of negative history that we got to, like, look at the whole thing completely here. George Mason, when he introduced it, did not include this line when they enter into a state of society. So it would have read all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which they cannot by compact deprive or divest. But Edmund Pendleton... No, thank you, Edmund. He made a motion to add that phrase when they enter into a state of society to ensure to make it clear that what they were voting on did not include enslaved populations. So that's uh, unfortunate, but it is part of the history and we should mention that as well. Uh, but it certainly is influential. We can understand those core principles and reject the notion of being OK with slavery at the same time. So here's section two. All power is vested in and consequently derived from the people and that magistrates are their trustees and servants and at all times amenable to them. Kevin Gutzman says there are some other notable sections at the beginning. These are general political principle. They included Section 3's claim that a majority has a right to replace government with which it is discontented. <laughs> That's a... Kind of not a really high bar there. Section 4, statement that offices should not be hereditary. Of course, we know that in January of 76, Thomas Paine's Common Sense was published, and it certainly was railing against the notion of a hereditary monarchy. So these types of views were catching on like wildfire. They certainly were catching on, and people were opposed, completely opposed to the idea of hereditary leadership, rulers. And uh, we may be... Uh, pretty close to that today. I mean, it's an elective despotism without without a doubt. And that's what we are warned against by people like Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, and others, and James Madison citing Thomas Jefferson, etc. But they did not want this type of power to have so much continuity to it. And then if you look at the deep state, that's another story. Section 5 statement, Kevin writes, in favor of term limits for all government officials. And Section 6, I think we're kind of getting out of these general principles, but that holders of sufficient property should be allowed to vote, and that only elective officials should have the power to tax. So I'm not as excited about those, but they're there. Now, Gordon Lloyd over at teachingamericanhistory.org has a really interesting point here. We're talking about a declaration of rights. And if you look at the Bill of Rights today, there's no foundational principles like this. They're literally the right to uh, free speech, free press, trial by jury, the right to keep and bear arms, things like that. These are in, we're generally thinking about individual rights, property rights, self-ownership, and things like that. And they don't start out the Declaration of Rights in Virginia. George Mason certainly didn't, and they passed it without thinking about that first. And here's how Gordon Lloyd put it. The rights list, and he put rights in quotes because it's confusing to a lot of people, listed in the first five sections might strike the contemporary reader as odd. It is important to remember, however, that among the most fundamental rights articulated by the revolutionary generation was the right of the people to choose their form of government. The right to local self-government was so important to the structure. It was a foundational maxim to James Madison when he introduced the Bill of Rights that he wanted separation of powers and what became the Tenth Amendment to be part of a new article in the Constitution in and of itself. 
And so this was so essential to them, and they included it as a right. They thought of things like the 10th and the 9th Amendment as rights. So you talk about states' rights. It isn't about states having individual liberty. It is about the people of each state having the right to say, well, we're going to control our own destiny here, and we're not going to be a copy of what the central or the general government is uh, telling us we have to be. Anyway, so then we have sections on individual rights, starting primarily in Section 8, right against self-incrimination, right to confront one's accusers and other witnesses, the right to a speedy trial, the right to a trial by jury. Section 9 talks about cruel and unusual punishments. It's a precursor to the Eighth Amendment. Section 10 opposed general warrants, so Fourth Amendment. Section 11 is trial by jury. Section um, 12 is freedom of the press, and it's called one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty. That the, They said the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by despotic government. So they're establishing a statement of principles. They aren't saying that this Section 12 is guaranteeing people the freedom of the press. It's not giving anyone a right. It's just noting that the only people who try to restrain it or control it are despotic governments. And it's certainly very despotic today. Section 13 that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people, the body of the people, trained to arms, is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. That standing army, so they always combine the right to keep and bear arm as opposition to standing armies. I know I've been saying that a lot lately, but a lot of people miss this. Generally, the people who oppose large military spending today are also opposed to the right to keep and bear arms. And the people who support the right to keep and bear arms love the military. And it's really, you got to combine those two. The right to keep and bear arms are there to protect against the bane of liberty. George Mason himself says, you know, I have great respect to those who serve, but whenever a standing army is established, whenever, anytime, the people lose their liberty. And it may be at the hand of the standing army, but it also can come through the heavy taxation to fund it and control it and to run it. Anyways, standing armies in times of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty. And then in all cases, all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. So that's so essential as well. And I think Kevin Gutzman actually has a great summary of this here. He says the influence of the Virginia Declaration of Rights would be hard to exaggerate. And we can see so many of these foundational principles, whether it's from the Declaration of Independence, we're getting close to Independence Day, July 4th, or Independence Day, July 2nd, if you're thinking about the Lee Resolution as well. But we can also see this in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. But he also points out that many of these provisions were used in other states, whether their own declarations or their own state revolutionary constitutions. Thomas Jefferson, helping Frenchmen draft their revolution's declaration of the rights of man and citizen, saw to it that some of the Virginia provisions were essentially translated into that document. From France, it made into other charters in other countries. It even got into the U.N. version. Not that we're fans of the U.N., but it's been transplanted to so many countries, and it goes all the way back to George Mason in 1776, and really the English Bill of Rights in 1689. And if we're talking about separation of powers, we're talking about Montesquieu in 1748 and other, other good stuff. Anyways, George Mason, Kevin writes, and to a much lesser extent, James Madison. James Madison actually put a stronger... Let's look at Section 16, because this was really James Madison's input here uh, about uh, freedom for religion. And George Mason had kind of a weakish version of it. And Madison's version came out like this. Religion or the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Man, that is an awesome statement. It's almost non-aggression principle. It's like you have your choices, and as long as you aren't harming other people, those are your own choices, your own reason, and it's up to you to own the consequences of that, but not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience, conscience and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love and charity towards each other. We don't have a lot of 
forbearance, love, and charity towards each other in the society that is centralized and that every decision is forced upon the entire population by a central power that's the largest central power in the history of the planet as far as the amount of spending that it does, the largest empire. That's what we are warned against. Mercy Otis warned, warned us about this. When party feuds uh, divide a nation, all semblance of human kindness really are set aside. And here they are saying in the Declaration, Virginia Declaration of Rights, which influenced so many other documents, we should all practice this way of living. And that really strikes me, forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. Because really, if we think about it, the people that hate your liberty, well, and I don't act like this a lot myself, and I really need to more, but we're all victims. We're victims of a government-run school system. We're victims of uh, parents who are victims of a government-run school system. And we can go through generation after generation after generation how we aren't taught about any of these important foundational principles or why. Why is it important to have separation of powers? Well, you'll know if you check out that episode that I covered as well, which I could pull up on the screen here. What is it? The other 16th Amendment, separation of powers. Anyways, back to Kevin Gutzman. George Mason, and to a much lesser extent, James Madison, had a powerful effect on legal charters all over the world. Some of the most influential writing in history. No wonder we're not taught about it, right? No wonder Thomas Jefferson, he writes, begged to be relieved of his congressional duties so that he could go home to Virginia and join in writing his state's Declaration of Rights and Constitution. And... Man, Gutsman's books on Madison and Jefferson are incredible. You should check those out. He said this was the ground of the entire struggle with the British. Now, John Adams had a different view, is more James Otis centered. Thomas Jefferson was a little bit more Virginia centered, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. He saw uh, the, the Stamp Act and, of course, Patrick Henry's resolutions against the Stamp Act, 1764, when they started planning it, and then his resolutions in May of 1765. That was his view of the really the beginning of the revolution in thought and the opposition. He said this was the ground of the entire struggle with the British. Dejectedly, he had to settle for writing the Declaration of American Independence instead. Kevin really has a way with words. I do, you know, this type of stuff I think is so, so important for us to get out there, especially because the government schools go out of their way to not teach us this stuff. Or when they do, they gloss over it or they only highlight something that's bad, that we need to cover it in completion. We have to understand where this stuff comes from and why Otherwise, we have no idea why things happen today or why things should be structured a certain way. And when they're not, why we have so much tyranny, why people are at each other's throats, things like that. And there's nothing that helps us reach and teach more people about the foundation of the Constitution, about liberty, how to defend both when government refuses to do so, which is constantly, than the financial faith and support of our members. Nothing helps us get that job done more than that. You can support us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. We've got monthly memberships that start at two bucks. We've got annual ones, five-year, lifetime, and I'm extremely grateful for any consideration you can give to joining us today. Thank you so much. I won't keep going with that, but let me take a look over in the the chat and see if there's any question or comment. You, Kirk Morrison, the Virginia Declaration is about self-government. It is about the inherent natural right of the people being able to make their own choices. And that's kind of the structure of what they did under the Constitution. They delegated, not gave away certain powers to a general government. James Madison pointed this out in Federalist 45. The powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government, to the general government, are few and defined. They just thought that there needed to be some kind of centralized direction on a few things, foreign policy, uh, trade, keeping uh, keeping commerce regular among the several states, things like that. Unfortunately, some of the things that we were warned about, about ambiguities in the document, have come to pass. But it really is up to the people, because if it's the inherent right of the people to alter, to abolish, to restrict, to limit, to keep their magistrates in check, then the people really have failed. Whether they failed because they hate liberty, which I think is the case in many times, or they failed because they are ignorant of the fact that it's their job to do it instead of relying on the government to limit itself or just choosing new bums to replace the old ones, whatever your views are, this has been a failure. And of course, Thomas Jefferson famously, at least in my world, famously wrote that if a nation expects to be ignorant, ignorant and free in a state of civilization. It expects what 
never was and never will be. Clay Kent, you're absolutely right. The citizens fell asleep at the wheel a long, long time ago. So I think on the one hand, the people who believe in liberty have fallen asleep in many situations. And the people who hate liberty have expanded in numbers because we are literally, literally surrounded by people who can't stand liberty. Liberty revolution is correct. The courts have really distorted the term regulate. We were warned that giving all power to one branch, basically, in a way, that's kind of how it is. We're told that the Constitution means what the Supreme Court tells us it means, not what the founders and ratifiers told us it means. It means what the Supreme Court has interpreted until the Supreme Court changes its mind, and it may just change it over and over and over, and they're going to look at one thing one way, and they're going to expand power when it's politically necessary, and on and on and on. Uh, let's see how Robert Scott Bell says, FDA-approved drug-induced slumber. Yeah, that's a big part of it as well. And you guys should check out RSB's show. He's uh, six days a week, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific time, and then Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. I'm only thinking Pacific time. But uh, Robert's a great friend, and he's got a lot of interesting stuff on his show as well. Uh, Dixie Strong makes a good point. We got need to quit saying states' rights. And I generally don't use that except when I'm trying to explain that we're talking about a right to local self-government. Uh, we need to quit saying states' rights. So we don't have to explain that all the time. With you guys, I can explain the difference. But in general, when I'm talking with the general public, we're posting social posts or we're, we're making public statements from 10th Amendment Center. We don't talk about we got to expand states' rights. I like the idea of talking about self-government and sovereignty and decentralization, federalism, localism, things like that, individual liberty. Uh, if they wish to govern, govern themselves, asked Blue North Wind, then they also don't have to choose a governing body. Yes, they do not. They do not. Uh, it is up to the people in each area to make their own choice, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if we can answer that question under the Constitution today, but under that foundational principle, certainly, I think that's an important question. Poet Fisherman, we've fallen so far from local self-government. It's amazing what the federal purse strings can accomplish simply by promising to untie or not untie. And I think, again, unfortunately, a lot of times people are begging for that. People always, one side or another, we've got these two kind of primary sides. One side want, wants to use the largest government in history to force their view of society on everybody. And then the other side does it back and forth and back and forth. And George Washington, in his farewell address, drafted by both Madison first and then revised by Alexander Hamilton under his direction, specifically warned about this, that one side against the other, over and over, fighting back against each other, oftentimes in the spirit of revenge, they tell us, this in and of itself is a frightful despotism, leads to a permanent one as well. And that's what we really got to get away with. We have to go back to this idea of local self-government, ignore Washington, D.C., focus our efforts on making the change in our own area, in our own communities, in our own states, in our own lives as well. We have to kind of look at that section 16, man. I'm going to repeat this one more time. It is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. With that, I think that's a good time to wrap up. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something. More than anything, I hope you learned something. Uh, again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members is where you can put your financial faith behind our work. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty is the show homepage. You'll also find the membership program there. Smash the like button, leave reviews on Apple Podcasts, all the other platforms, and uh, that helps us spread the word. Thanks again for being here. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.